Hello, everyone. In this lecture, I'll be explaining the mitochondrial protein import pathway, and then I will transition into talking about the mitochondrial unfolded protein response, or uh, MTUPR, which is actually very intricately tied to mitochondrial import. I'll then finish by discussing the process of mitophagy, which is also tied, with, tied in with these other processes. So hopefully by the end of the lecture, you're gonna have a good understanding of mitochondrial signaling as it relates to mitochondrial import, the MTUPR, and mitophagy. This is the general pathway of mitochondrial import. So mitochondrial proteins that are to be imported are first uh, translated in the cytosol uh, as usual, um, but they, these proteins that are being translated contain a mitochondrial localization sequence which is usually right around here in N-terminal. So the mitochondrial targeting sequence is usually a 50 or a 10 to 50 amino acid uh, N-terminal sequence uh, consisting of hydrophobic and positively charged uh, amino acids. Uh, namely, uh, most sequences are rich in positively charged arginine and hydrophobic non-charged amino acids like glycine or leucine. And this forms what's called an N-terminal amphipathic alpha helix. These N-terminal amphipathic alpha helices are recognized by, by uh, mitochondrial receptors called uh, TOM20 and TOM22. TOM20 and TOM22 are part of this larger TOM complex. And uh, TOM itself stands for translocation of the outer membrane. And TOM20 and TOM22 are these specific receptor subunits that bind to the uh, mitochondrial targeting sequences in our, our precursor protein. The protein is then transferred to the TOM40 subunit, which is gonna be right through here. It's, uh, TOM40 is going to be in the intermembrane space and um, it contains the actual channel that um, the proteins can be pulled through in order to get into the mitochondria. So the driving force for this translocation is the um, ATP-dependent um, HSP70 protein, which is a part of a larger complex called the PAM, P-A-M complex. PAM stands for Pre-Sequence Associated Motor Complex, and it provides the polling force to import proteins into the intermembrane space through the TOM40 channels. So PAM would be right around, maybe right here. It's not in this diagram, but that's where it would be. And it's providing the polling force um, by uh, using ATP hydrolysis, which is gonna be accomplished through the HSP70 uh, subunit. So in, once the protein has been transported into the intermembrane space, the protein has four uh, fates, depending on where the protein is to end up. It can be inserted into the outer membrane through the activity of this uh, SAM complex. Um, also, sometimes the protein can be directly inserted into the outer mem membrane through the MIM1 complex. Sometimes it doesn't need to do this roundabout pathway, but just be directly inserted. Uh, it can also be inserted into the inner membrane through the action of TIM22. TIM22 can take a protein and then insert it into the uh, inner mitochondrial membrane. And this protein might be a intermembrane space protein. So it may simply want to be in the intermembrane space, not bound to anything. And um, that's often done by cleavage right here, it's usually inserted into the membrane and then cleaved, which will release it, or the protein can uh, be targeted by MIA. MIA is a, a protein that forms disulfide bridges. And typically when these proteins ha ha are have their disulfide bridges formed by MIA1, it kind of locks the protein in the intermembrane space. And lastly, the protein can be imported into the mitochondrial matrix. 
And this occurs through the action of TIM23, or translocation of the inner membrane 23. Now this is where things get interesting. I'll ask you a simple question. What is the resting membrane potential of the inner mitochondrial membrane? The resting membrane potential. So remember, an electrical potential simply means that there's a difference in charge between two membranes. And in the context of mitochondria, where are the protons being pumped? Are there more, pro more protons down here or out here? There's obviously more protons um, on the, uh, in, in the intermembrane space, right? And this causes the resting membrane potential of a healthy mitochondrion to be around 180 millivolts, which is a lot. So there are lots of protons over here. So you have lots of positive charges over here clinging to this uh, inner mitochondrial membrane. And there's lots of negative charges down here, which are mainly from proteins. So why is that important? Why is it important that there's positive charges over there and negative charges over here? Well, remember, the charge of our amphipathic targeting sequence, the charge of our amphipathic targeting sequence is primarily positively charged. So these, these positively charged arginine residues, they want to be moved towards the negative charges, which are going to be in the matrix. They want to be translocated into the matrix. And this is this process of electrogradient uh, mediated transport is called electrophoretic transfer. So again, the in terminal positively charged helix of our precursor protein, um, they are electrophoretically transported through the TIM23 uh, transporter into the matrix of the mitochondria. This is called electrophoretic transfer. Now what happens if the mitochondrial gets sick or becomes dysfunctional for whatever reason? The, this causes the membrane potential to be lost. The hallmark of a dysfunctional mitochondrion is the loss of membrane potential due to a loss of efficient proton pumping. And that's key because if a mitochondrion gets sick, it's no longer able to import proteins very efficiently. And this leads to a process called mitophagy, but uh, we're going to discuss that later. But just remember this mechanism of depolarization-induced translocation stalling. So again, it's called depolarization-induced translocation stalling because when the membrane potential is lost, there's no electrophoretic transfer. There's no pulling force. These positive charges positive charges on the protein aren't going to be pulled into the negatively charged matrix because it's been depolarized. In addition, there's this another PAM complex, PAM, and the PAM complex in the uh, matrix uh, performs a similar function. It contains an HSP70 subunit, which uses ATP to pull proteins through the translocon. And again, ATP generation is also obviously lost following depolarization. So in a sick mitochondrion, uh, protein import stalls because of the loss of electrophoretic transfer and the loss of ATP. We need ATP coming into this PAM complex, and we also need abundant negative charges down here in, in order for the positively charged alpha helix to be pulled in. Anyways, if the mitochondrion is healthy, the protein is imported, that N-terminal pre-sequence that's positively charged gets cleaved off by MPP, or mitochondrial processing uh, peptidase. So if a mitochondrion becomes dysfunctional for, for whatever reason, what happens? Well, it begins with depolarization. Depolarization is the hallmark of a dysfunctional, mitochond uh, dysfunctional mitochondrion. And depolarization can be caused by many different th things like uh, reactive oxygen species, ROS, and these ROSs can inhibit the electron transport chain. You can have protein misfolding, um, mitochondrial DNA mutations, 
You can have toxic protein accumulation. And really, there's many other things. There's lots of different uh, probable causes of, of mitochondrial depolarization. The point is that mitochondrial dysfunction manifests itself primarily as depolarization. And mitochondrial depolarization leads to two primary uh, critical events. One, it opens mitochondrial permeability transition pores. Um, and two, it stalls protein import. So mitochondrial perme permeability transition pores, or uh, MPTPs for short, these are uh, voltage-gated channels that open following depolarization and they release various cytotoxic proteins like cytochrome C, as well as calcium, uh, which potentially causes excitotoxicity. And I'm, I'm not gonna focus on MPTPs in this lecture because I, am, I have a lecture on calcium dynamics that covers it. Instead, I'm gonna focus on how mitochondrial import inhibition triggers this MTUPR and mitophagy. So the UPR is basically a strategy to deal with accumulated misfolded proteins. Specifically, the UPR signaling leads to the upregulation of proteases, um, proteases and various folding chaperones that restore um, homeo protein homeostasis in the mitochondrion. And in general, this MTUPR is, is thought of as being cytoprotective because it helps deliver homeostasis restoring proteins back to the mitochondria. In fact, it might sound paradoxical, but research in worms suggests that chronic uh, mitochondrial UPR activation extends lifespan, presumably by promoting the expression of cytoprotective proteins. The MTUPR is primarily activated by the accumulation of oxidized proteins, which will uh, misfold and this occurs frequently in mitochondria because that's the site of our ROS production. And since ROS production is vastly upregulated following depolarization, this provides the, or at least a mechanism through which depolarization induced ROS generation causes protein misfolding. And this can cause the MTUPR. However, it's important to note that this can, this can be the other way around as well. You can have protein misfolding that causes ROS generation and depolarization. Really, these three ideas, uh, ROS generation, protein misfolding, and uh, translation um, or tra translocation are, are all very interconnected. So it's hard to pinpoint what's causing what. Typically, misfolded proteins are held in check by various proteases that degrade them. Most importantly are this uh, CLPX, in humans it's CLPX, uh, LON, LON1, and uh, YME1L, YME1L. There's also the PARL protease. PARL is another protease that would be right here on the intermembrane. Uh, I wanna highlight the YME and the uh, CLPX proteases real quick. So YME1L down here is a, a protease that is critical for proper mitochondrial morphology because it essentially regulates the mitochondrial intermembrane fusion protein called OPA1. Without YME1L, this OPA1 protein isn't cleaved into a functional form and this prevents mitochondria from fusing. So the loss or mutation of YME1L leads to a hyperfragmented mitochondria um, and basically leads to severe intellectual disability, uh, cardiomyopathy, and usually death at a young age. Because again, OPA1 is required for mitochondrial fusion and YME1L is responsible for cleaving OPA1 into a functional form. So if YME1L is gone, then mitochondria are hyperfragmented because they cannot fuse because OPA1 is not functional. The other really important protease is CLPX. CLPX is interesting because, um, at least in worms, it appears to have an affinity for misfolded proteins 
and it's also required for the MTUPR in, in worms. So current models suggest that CLPX is capable of chopping up misfolded proteins. And then um, some of these cleaved peptides are actually ejected uh, from the mitochondria through a transporter called HAF1. And this activates the UPR somehow. It activates the UPR. And this figure uh, suggests that it's possibly by inhibiting the translocation of this other protein called ATFS1, ATFS1. And again, this is all in C. elegans, but ATFS1 has generated a lot of interest because it's a critical mitochondrial UPR transcription factor. And ATFS1 is normally uh, degraded. Normally ATFS1 is, is constantly being degraded, but following depolarization, ATFS1 fails to move into the mitochondria. It's normally degraded in the mitochondria. However, during uh, depolarization, perhaps from CLPX uh, fragments, generated fragments, uh, ATFS, uh, ATFS does not get moved into the mitochondria. And instead, a, a nuclear localization signal that is also on ATFS1 instead directs it into the nucleus. So ATFS1 has both a mitochondrial targeting sequence and a nuclear targeting sequence. And ATFS1 prefers to go into the mitochondria where it's degraded. However, if something is preventing that from happening, perhaps misfolded or uh, chopped up mitochondrial proteins that have been ejected, it in, instead decides to go into the nucleus and trigger UPR gene expression. And this is an excellent model because it makes a lot of logical sense, but unfortunately a direct homologue of ATSF1 in mammals hasn't been identified. Another intriguing idea that I personally favor a lot is that partially degraded mitochondrial proteins that have been ejected from the mitochondria are um, somehow inhibiting or clogging the TIM23 complex or the TOM, TIM or the TOM23 uh, complexes because, I mean, this makes sense because mitochondrial proteins in the first place, they would be ha they would have an affinity for the mitochondria. And perhaps when they're partially degraded, they maybe come back. Maybe they try and get back into the mitochondria because maybe they still contain some kind of targeting sequence. And this could uh, inhibit the translocation complexes. And this would cause the accumulation of ATSF or other proteins. And this might explain why mitochondrial proteins mislocalized to the cytoplasm are extremely toxic. In fact, uh, studies have shown that mitochondrial proteins that are not in the mitochondria are extremely toxic. Um, and I would speculate that this is because um, they inhibit the Tim Tom complex and that causes some kind of protein to accumulate, which then moves into the nucleus and triggers gene expression. Another more straightforward and obvious mechanism of inducing the UPR is uh, simply through ROS generation. So we know that misfolded proteins can cause increased ROS release because there's depolarization, increased ROS generation, and this activates signaling pathways, such as the GCN2 kinase. Uh, GCN2 is a kinase that is a part of the integrated stress response, ISR, which I'm not gonna go into detail because I have I have two or three lectures on it, but GCN2 is basically a kinase that inhibits protein translation by phosphorylating EIF2A uh, or alpha. And this leads to the inhibition of um, translation. So the phosphorylation of EIF2A inhibits translation. However, it also leads to the translation of alternative reading frames or downstream reading frames uh, like CHOP. It leads to the alternative um, expression of CHOP and ATF4, 
ATF four is a very big one, very important. And so ROS mediated activation of GCN two can then phosphorylate EIF two alpha, which leads to the expression of ATF four and CHOP, which um, influences gene expression, upregulates chaperones, proteases, antioxidants, and everything else. In humans, the MTUPR is really uh, poorly uh, understood, but some basics that we do know is that EIF2 alpha phosphorylation down here um, is critical. That is EIF2 alpha phosphorylation induced expression of ATF4 and CHOP is required for mitochondrial UPR gene expression. So in the end, ATF4 and CHOP so our ATF4 and CHOP are required for gene expression following uh, protein misfolding in the mitochondria. So exactly how this happens isn't really understood. Something is signaling from the mitochondria to ATF4 and CHOP, and some evidence, evidence suggests it's GCN2. But it's likely, to, I mean, it probably has something to do with mitochondrial depolarization because that's the obvious hallmark of mitochondrial dysfunction. And depolarization can signal either through ROS signaling or partially translocated proteins. So a logical place to start when looking for mechanisms of EIF2A phosphorylation, remember this is the critical event that leads to the expression of CHOP and ATF4, a logical place to start would be to um, look at the Tim and Tom complexes and see if there's any relationship between uh, the inhibition of trans, uh, uh, translocation and EIF2A phosphorylation and ROS signaling. So it's, it's probably has something to do with uh, either of those aspects. But again, the ATF4 and the CHOP transcription factors are critical for the MTUPR. Um, anyways, in this next slide, we're going to see a prime example of how partially translocated proteins initiate signaling pathways, specifically mitophagy. So this, the inhibition of TIM23 or the depolarization of mitochondria can cause protein stalling which induces something called mitophagy. And we'll see that in the next slide. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about mitophagy. And mitophagy is the process of a mitochondrion being recognized and digested in the autophagosome. And it begins with this protein called PINK1. Begins with this protein called PINK1. PINK1 is a kinase that is transcribed in the cytosol in the cytoplasm, and it's mostly degraded by cytoplasmic proteases. It's for, you know, simply the proteasome. The proteasome comes in and degrades it, right? So in this figure, it shows that uh, pink one is being, uh, show, shows a low basal amount of pink one making it into the intermembrane space. Uh, so it escapes to the intermembrane space where it activates uh, TRAP1. And TRAP1 basically just reduces ROS generation and it reduces cytochrome C release. Uh, but that mechanism isn't really understood. And it's, 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 it, it's not what's so exciting about, about uh, PINK1. So although this is interesting, this isn't the main mechanism that PINK1 is functioning through. What is exciting about PINK1 is what happens when the mitochondria becomes depolarized. When, so PINK1 is unable to translocate into depolarized mitochondria. And instead, PINK1 gets stuck at the outer mitochondrial membrane, as it is here, like OMM, outer mitochondrial membrane. So in this figure on the right, PINK1 has gotten stuck in the TOM complex. And interestingly, PINK1 stuck in the TOM complex retains its kinase activity and it begins phosphorylating proteins. So it's protected from the proteasome that is out here. There's a proteasome out here 
and it can't get to and degrade pink one. And pink one is also retaining its kinase activity. Uh, pink one, when it's stuck in the complex, will begin phosphorylating different proteins, including, most importantly, the cytoplasmic uh, E3 ubiquitin ligase called parkin. It phosph pink one phosphorylates parkin at its UBL domain, and this displaces the inhibitory UBL domain from the ring domain of parkin. So ring domain is the actual ubiquitin ligating domain, and pink one phosphorylates and removes the inhibitory UBL domain from parkin. So pink one phosphorylates and activates the E3 ubiquitin ligase parkin. Pretty simple. Additionally, the UBL domain on parkin that is phosphorylated by pink one is about 50% similar to ubiquitin proteins. And so not surprisingly, it was later found that pink one also phosphorylates ubiquitin. We see that in, right here. And pink one phosphorylated ubiquitin, which occurs at uh, serine 65, I believe, um, is the preferred ubiquitin species for parkin. So the uh, serine 65 ubiqui uh, phosphorylated ubiquitin is Parkin's favorite form of ubiquitin to use when it makes polyubiquitin chains. So remember, Parkin is our E3 ubiquitin ligase, and the, it, the specific species of ubiquitin that Parkin 1 uses to build polyubiquitin chains is the ubiquitin that has been phosphorylated by Pink 1. So not only is Parkin activated by Pink 1, but Parkin's ubiquitin substrate is also activated by pink one. Parkin will then catalyze the polyubiquitination of um, various outer mitochondrial membrane proteins using these phosphorylated ubiquitin proteins. And uh, not shown in this image is uh, the counteracting activity of USP30. So USP30. 30 uh, is the only mitochondrial outer membrane protein, or sorry, the only mitochondrial outer membrane localized deubiquitinase that is capable of reversing or counteracting Parkin mediated ubiquitination. So USP30 is a deubiquitinase localized to the outer mitochondrial membrane that will cleave up these polyubiquitinations. So USP30 is basically the counteracting force in this process. And in the next slide, we'll talk about how polyubiquitination actually leads to engulfment of the mitochondrion by autophagy. But before that, simply note that Parkin, Parkin sounds suspiciously like Parkinson's disease, and that's because Parkin mutations are linked to Parkinson's disease. And the common mutations observed in Parkin cause it to be significantly harder to activate. And thus the rate of mitophagy is generally much lower, which is actually hypothesized to lead to the accumulation of, of ROS spewing uh, damaged mitochondria and this leads to disease. So the whole point of this process, this mitophagy process, the whole point is to identify depolarized mitochondria and again, it, it identifies depolarized my, mitochondria by failing to translocate into the matrix. And once these depolarized mitochondria have been identified, they get polyubiquitinated by Parkin, and this signals for mitophagy, for you know, degradation in the autophagosome. The defective mitochondria that are allowed to accumulate in Parkinson's disease because of a mutation in Parkin, these defective depolarized mitochondria uh, will proliferate. And they not only spew uh, ROS reactive oxygen species because it's depolarized, it's just spewing ROS species, it also will spread their defective mitochondrial DNA, kind of like an infection. So mitophagy functions as a negative selection pressure 
for our mitochondria within the microenvironment of our cells. So mitophagy is a really important process for uh, selecting the most fit mitochondria because we don't want damaged mitochondria. We want to get rid of them as soon as possible. Otherwise, they damage the rest of our cell by releasing reactive oxygen species and by spreading their, their damaged DNA or mitochondrial DNA. So at this point, we have a depolarized mitochondria, it's depolarized, and it has resulted in uh, pink one getting stuck in the Tom complex. So imagine this is pink one. This is pink one, it has been stuck in the Tom complex and it's now phosphorylating cytosolic proteins. Most importantly, pink one is phosphorylating and activating Parkin by, by displacing its inhibitory UBL domain from its ring domain. And pink one is also phosphorylating ubiquitin, so Parkin can use it. And if this exceeds the rate of USP, D, uh, USP30 deubiquitination, then it leads to the accumulation of polyubiquitinated proteins on the outer mitochondrial membrane. These polyubiquitinations are recognized by a class of proteins called autophagic cargo uh, adapters. Uh, autophagic cargo adapters, including most importantly, uh, OPTN and P62. There's also a bunch of other ones, but in terms of mitophagy, those are the big, the big players, are OPTN and P62. OPTN and P62 will bind to these ubiquitin chains, these ubiquitin chains, using a UBA domain. UBA stands for ubiquitin associated domain. So these adapters that have bound to ubiquitinated, polyubiquitinated proteins then use another domain called a LIR, L-I-R, or LC3 interacting region to bind to the LC3 on autophagic membranes, and this in induces autophagy. So P62 for, and, and uh, OPTN form a bridge between ubiquitinated mitochondria and LC3 coded autophagosomes. Now, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to talk any more about aut autophagy, but if you're interested in, in that process, uh, I do have a lecture on it. The basic idea is that OPTN or P62 form the bridge between uh, the uh, depolarized mitochondria and the autophagic membrane. Still though, there are some big questions and uh, I don't wanna confuse anyone, but the research suggests that pink one overexpression can induce mitophagy even without Parkin. So we've been talking about how important Parkin for these polyubiquitins, but um, Parkin isn't necessarily needed if you overexpress pink one, and that's not understood how that happens. In addition, the phosphorylated ubiquitin that is added by Parkin one uh, doesn't appear to be a good substrate for the autophagic cargo adapters. So these cargo adapters that bind to uh, ubiquitinated proteins in order to form the bridge, they don't prefer to bind to phosphorylated ubiquitins. So these two ideas are, uh, Kind of inconsistent with current models of mitophagy and so there's definitely research need that needs to be done in in order to fully understand this process uh, in terms of mitophagy regulation it's important to note uh this kinase tbk1 i forget what it stands for it's like tank binding kinase or something it has tank in it which i thought was weird anyways tbk1 interacts with uh, various autophagic cargo adapters like uh, optn and P62, and it phosphorylates them, which uh, results in an increased affinity for ubiquitin chains. And preventing this interaction between OPTN um, and TBK1 by uh, site-directed mutagenesis, if you mutate the uh, residue that's phosphorylated on OPTN by TBK1, it significantly impairs this process of mitophagy. So it's pretty important. Okay, so the big question at this point is how do all these different concepts tie together? So I may have sound somewhat schizophrenic talking about these all these different ideas that don't that are, are kind of hard to relate, but it, it kind of just depends on how you're looking at it. But 
generally, if we have so if we have mitochondrial dysfunction for whatever reason, we see depolarization and translo translocation failure. And this causes mitophagy through this process, right? Pink one mediated Parkin one recruitment. And it also causes the mitochondrial UPR, perhaps by increasing the rate of ROS generation, or maybe there's maybe there's uh, expulsion of mis uh, of peptide fragments, you know, partially digested proteins, maybe they come back and inhibit the translocons, uh, the Tim, uh, Tim Tong complex. So the fact is though, in the end, is that we don't know much about how these pathways interconnect, but we do know they interconnect. So we just need to do a little more research. So we know, we don't know how they, inter they interconnect, but we do know that they do. So the cause and effect in, in, in this presentation is really hard to pinpoint because, um, for example, depolarization can lead to misfolded proteins. Misfolded proteins can lead to depolarization. Uh, ROS generation can cause misfolded proteins or misfolded proteins can cause ROS production. So it's it, trying to understand where the defect begins is really uh, context dependent and depends on what you're researching. So I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation, even though it seemed to look kind of like I was jumping around to all these different concepts, but th they are connected. We just don't really understand exactly how they connect yet, but they're definitely all related in some way. Anyways, if you guys have any questions at all, please feel free to comment. I'll be happy to talk about these processes. I really enjoy talking about them. And uh, thanks for watching.